We're glad to know you're still there and watching us on uh, The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Um, today is a Thursday, and Thursday we talk a lot of business, but uh, right now let's see what is on uh, the papers. So, of the press, what are we taking of the press today? We'll begin with the leadership newspaper. Leadership newspaper leads uh, with a story. Federal government labor talks deadlocked as marketers raise fuel pump price. Labor, federal government labor talks deadlock as uh, marketers raise fuel pump price. Uh, we also have uh, another headline there, tackle insecurity, poverty, northern elders tell president. Troops kill, um, troops kill 51, 55 ice swap top commanders, terrorist in Bornu. Nigeria's tax to GDP ratio rises to 10.86%. Okay. Um, We'll take those, uh, okay, 10th National Assembly, uh, intrigues in Senate threaten Apabio's endorsement, uh, which means the, 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 uh, the choice of the party and the president may find it difficult in getting elected as the Senate president. Tinubu, INEC, APC asked tribunal to dismiss Atiku's documents. APC Governor Speak Uzodima as a PGF Chairman. Okay, those were the headlines uh, from uh, the leadership newspaper. You can see photographs there. Um, when under the headlines of federal government and uh, labor talks deadlock, people are lying down in filling stations, vehicles are queuing and all that. So we'll move from there to the nation uh, where we're going to see their own headlines. The nation leads with NNPCL fixes 488 Naira to 557 Naira per litre of petrol as a price template from, four, from 488 to 557 Naira NNPC. Uh, 200 reps backing me, says Abbas. Okay. Um, that story also on the National Assembly is there, and you can read it up on the nation. We have other smaller headlines, National Honours Awardees to Wait. You know, we had a story that uh, they cannot collect the certificate yet. Hearing in LP or B petitions stalled, PDP forges ahead. That's also a story there on page 8 um, of the nation newspaper, or rather page 6 of the nation newspaper. Senate, NPAN, pay tribute to media magnate Dr. C, PDP Senators Orogide uh, Akinye Lure, dump party. They have moved to another party. Okay, and then we'll have uh, this 10th tent, tent Senate, support the progressives. That's what uh, someone is saying. Uh, about the Tenth Assembly, when they are trying to make their choice, they should for support the progressives. Okay, we'll move to another newspaper. Uh, this time, it's going to be the Guardian. The Guardian newspaper it leads with posers about eight hundred million dollars palliative labor's next move as Nigerians brace for higher inflation. Uh, that story is there. That's the one leading in the Guardian. The Guardian, uh, no work, no pay. Falano sues federal government over alleged unfair treatment of ASU members. Mm. We have not heard the last of that story. Um, panic in Lagos community over fuel leakage, broken pipeline. I do hope the government will do something about that as fast as possible. 26% um, of Nigerians financially literate as Botswana leads Africa. We also have OT suspends levies on transport operators in Abia. Um, resetting Nigeria's foreign policy to be giant of Africa again. All these are stories that you find on the Guardian uh, newspaper this morning. Uh, we will take the final newspaper this morning, which is Business Day. Thursday is our business day. <laughs> so 
It's only natural that we take business day to day. They lead with petrol to sell between 478 naira and 600 naira per liter as subsidy goes. The riders there are commuters lament as transporters hike fares. NNPC says federal government owes 2.8 trillion naira for subsidy payments. Okay. Those are stories on uh, business day. We have smaller headlines. One of them is 27 Nigerian companies defy odds to shine in FT ranking. That's good news. Eurobond stocks naira jump as Tinubu hits ground running. Uh, rising mental health aid fails to offset government shortfalls. Those are stories on business day. And that's the much we can take from off the press. Uh, okay, that, that's the much we can take from the newspapers uh, right now. Just the reading. Uh, that's how far we can go. But we are glad to be joined by our analyst for today that will be talking on the headlines, Ezekiel Nyaitok, a public affairs analyst, uh, joining us from Aquaibom. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. Joining you from Abuja this time. Right? Oh, this time is Abuja. Did you go for the inauguration? Yes, I did, but not of uh, Mr. President. Um, actually, it's a very interesting story. I should have been in the studio this morning. Wow. I, I went to Kano, where my friend is the, is the, is the current governor, and uh, my, my friend, big friend, is um, the boss, the don, that the, mm. you know, and um, I was to come to Lagos straight from there to be with you in the studio today, but uh, unfortunately, my flight was moved till around um, 11, 12, midnight, and I didn't like that, so I decided to um, take the Abuja, rather, and come house. And guess what? The flight did not leave till 3.30. So I actually got home about 4, 4.30 this morning. And um, I hope I will not be sleeping while I'm talking to you, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll keep it. <laughs> I, I hope, too, the, the fares, uh, the airfares have not gone up as well. As no, not the airfares yet. But what actually upset me was when I landed in Abuja, because I said there was no need for them to come for me, mm. I, I would... Um, I would uh, find Fine my way. way. So I, I, I booked the boat, which came to 5,600. But when I called the guy, he said 20,000 naira last. Wow. And I was really upset because this is really the thing that, that, that pains me about Nigerians. I mean, have we... Uh, what, what's the level of increase that makes it such that even before your profit, do you understand me? Was that even if you say you're using 5,000 naira well, okay, to drop me and all that, are you going to make 15,000 naira profit in one trip? It's not possible. We all know that. But we always take advantage of every situation. How can you jump from 5,600 to 20,000 naira because, oh, fuel has moved from... Many of us were not even buying fuel for 1,000, for 195 naira to start with. A lot of people were buying at around that 200 to, 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 to 250. So it's more like, to a lot of people, it's, it's like double. In fact, to some of us that were in Aquaibom, it's a little less than double, okay? But why would you now move from 5,500, 600 to 20,000 naira? And you see, this is the way, you know, and, and we talked to that, that driver in a language that he will not forget for a long time. Mm. Okay, but uh, now uh, the, the, the meeting between the federal government and labor uh, ended in deadlock, and solutions are not found. Meanwhile, the people are suffering. Would like your comments on what is going on right now. Well, the government has been proactive. Uh, they have listened to labor. They have had a meeting immediately with labor, but still there is no solution. Uh, what are your comments on what the labor well, people are yes. fighting for and what the federal government is saying? Yes. This is an extremely sensitive um, topic to handle at this time. And a lot of commentators are playing to the gallery. They want to say what the people want to hear and be popular. 
But the responsibility of leadership, if you realize I, I'm still even in the tribunal because I want to be or I wanted to be, I want to be whichever is the case, the governor of a quiet home state. Now, that is a very big leadership responsibility. So when it comes to the topic of the fuel subsidy removal and everything, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of sentiment, there's a lot of trauma. So we must approach it with cautious optimism with level of sincerity and inform the people about the pros and the cons. And then while we look at the, the, the problems and the, the faults where they are, we look more at what the possible solutions are. I think number one fault came from Mr. President, and he has to be very mindful of what he says. You now speak not as Jagaban. You where you can afford the luxury of saying, my guy, it doesn't matter, man. So, you know, you are now speaking presidentially as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, leading over 200 million people. Where was the problem? The fuel subsidy is gone. That was not true. Fuel subsidy was not gone because what he meant was that after June, there is no more provision, so it is going. So if, I don't know if that was part of the script, if I was the one that wrote it, I would have come through the back door. Considering that there is no more provision for subsidy, it means that we must be very proactive to come up with palliatives and measures that will cushion the effect of its eventual removal from the common man in particular. To that end, I will work assiduously in concert with labor to ensure that there is a smooth transition in a phase and in a manner that will not leave Nigerians the worse for it. If he had said that, the, the reaction would have become completely different. Now you are coming to Tell labor, let's talk. You've already taken a decision. After taking a decision, you say, labor, let's talk. Are we talking that that decision you took, your major, first major decision should be reversed? How will that work on you? Or are we talking to say, uh, what do we do going forward? So I think that we must realize that we've come to run government. And that government and governance is an extremely serious matter where you cannot afford the luxury of, of joking or being casual or lackadaisical or whimsical. You must be, it's like within diplomatic circles, every word that a president utters is, is put on the crucible. Is, is dissected, is analyzed, is synthesized. So you cannot afford the luxury of speaking casually. To that extent, I hold Mr. President responsible, but I believe that this is just the beginning. So Nigerians should um, forgive and then come to the table and say, what do we do? You know, in the last administration, uh, during President Jonathan's administration, uh, I think the beginning, when he talked of um, removing fuel subsidy, a body, the short P was set up. And one of the things that we did see of that short P was a lot of brand new buses that were bought and brought in and things like that. So uh, those were to cushion the effect of on the transporters. While, while, while I was at the airport, the hours that I had, I had to do a lot of um, reflecting on issues. And one of the issues I reflected on was my workers. Some of them earn as little as 30,000 Naira. And I'm just asking myself, two things are going to happen. One is that they are now going to use about 60 to 65% of their income, of their salary on transportation. If that happens, it means I should brace up myself for a lot of shortcut, you know, corner cutting and pilfering and things like that because they must survive and they are going to survive from somewhere. The second is that they are going to do a lot of trekking. If they are going to do a lot of trekking to come to work, I must brace myself to the fact that 
in the morning, we are going to have people who are worn out and they are going to take time out from 8 o'clock, maybe till about 10 o'clock before they can come to themselves to recover from the very long trek because they must have woken up very early and started trekking long distances. So the bus ride has to be like minimal. And from 2 o'clock, they are starting to have a mindset of, oh, my God, I'm walking back. Oh, my God, I'm walking back. Okay. And they probably try to sneak out and leave a little earlier to be able to walk back home. So productivity is going to be largely reduced. On the alternative, I've got to come up with a palliative of some sort, which could in mean increase in the salary, in their salary. But how am I going to do that when my overheads are going to increase across board? Petrol is going to be difficult, transportation, the generators are going to be a problem. So I'm just asking myself, God, what do I do? And the sort of business I do, you can't do virtually. I'm into real estate. I mean, you're, you're, you, you, can't, you can't be laying blocks of the house online. You've got to be up on site. So uh, we have to like um, restructure or reject our business, you know, model, and uh, maybe do think in terms of providing certain accommodation for a certain quality of a certain level of staff and things like that. But it's something that that's a national uh, concern. From the fuel and only revisit it if there is a need for that. Um, uh, there's this ongoing uh, thing about. Um, ASU and the federal government. We're still taking this from, uh, uh, from The Guardian. The Guardian has a, a headline saying, No work, no pay. Falano sues federal government over alleged unfair treatment of ASU members. Okay, so that judgment was given that no work, no pay. So for the eight months that ASU was on strike, uh, they are not going to pay. Some people have said that uh, it, it goes against labor laws and everything, uh, human rights and all that. Uh, but right now, they, 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 a human rights lawyer has gone to court uh, over what he feels is an injustice uh, to the lecturers. What are your comments? Okay, now what constitutes work? Because again, we must bring out a very delicate balancing. If I pay you for not working, what is the incentive for you to work? It means that at all times, you can always look for a reason for maybe you have some things you want to do somewhere and all that. You just say, uh, we don't agree with it, blah, 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 before you know there's a strike. That is one end of that uh, discussion or argument. There is a second hand. Uh, my, 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 my eldest sister, we're five, um, she's the first, I'm the last. My eldest sister happens to be a professor in, in the university. And during that period, she was busy working. That I knew. And, you know, by the time you, you come back to school, you've got to catch up with whatever were the aspects you could not do so as to ensure that that set of people, they are graduated and they make room for a new set of people to come in. So within that context, because of what she was doing, she has justification to say, I was working. Now, how are you going to treat her and you are fair to her? And how are you going to treat those who probably did not have such um, schedule of work to do and they went about doing other businesses and probably making money and, um, you know, and um, at the end of the day, they want to get their monies back. It is something that ASU needs to be reasonable, I would say, and it's something that government should not consider as being cast in stone. Again, when we come to negotiation and discussion, there's so much distrust among the people. There's so much insincerity among the people. We really look forward to a situation when or a time when our leaders can just have a little more of the fear of God and be a little more of leaders than politicians. Politicians couldn't care less. For politics is what you can get from what you don't deserve as much as possible. Speaking loud and saying nothing. That's politics. You know, being deceitful. As a matter of fact, if you say something, you say, oh man, you're talking politics. What that means is that you are lying. Okay? So, I think that ASU and the government really need to come and reconcile between the two 
and come up with uh, to say it's against the laws of labor. Laws of labor has to be flexible, has to be dynamic, and that's what laws are all about. So I am thinking that um, because I'm involved and I saw my sister, I've seen her, I know the work she's doing, I know she deserves a pay. So on behalf of the lecturers, I believe that there's a point. But if there's a certain administrative section that you say, okay, the task, I don't, I, it's something that you really need to, to sit down and, um, and iron out if we are sincere with ourselves. Well, let's stay with uh, the guy. And if you look, let me just hint this. If you look at the National Assembly members, how many of them, you know, go to work, so to speak? <laughs> how many are then also be on sittings? If they are not on sittings, there should be other schedules that they are doing either oversight or they are doing representation. But you realize that some of them are just absent. They are just absent. They are not in the, in the, in the, in the chambers, either the green or the red, and they are not in their constituencies. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually take up and they are abroad for a long time and they come back, and who is making noise about it? And they call it their pay, not just their regular pay, all the entitlements, all the emoluments, everything, they get all. Why is nobody talking about that? Mm. The other day, there was so, fracas between uh, the uh, Speaker of the House of Reps and uh, the Deputy Speaker, because the Speaker suggested... So imagine this. Yes. Speaker at a time like this. I, I watched it. Mm. Speaker at a time like this. For, for reasons I would speculate as being personal because you know in the absence if the speaker is to go for a function in his absence you know the deputy speaker sits okay mm. and you know there's this wahala between the two of them and then the speaker wants to go for a commissioning ceremony and he thinks that the national assembly or the the, the house of reps or the the green chambers should be shut down to go for commissioning of a project the deputy speaker actually did have a point he was being smart okay he said those who want to go can go, but we cannot shut down the business of the house mm. just to go for 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 commissioning of project. He 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 he, he got he got the speaker there, and um, it just shows how our prioritization is and how our personal interest will almost always override what I would call national interest. Okay. Um, uh, also, we've seen a story here, uh, resetting Nigeria's foreign policy to be giant of Africa again on The Guardian, page four. Uh, foreign policy is something of interest. Um, the giant of Africa was a name we really, really loved, and we can still be the giant of Africa. I don't know. What really changed? What does this present administration need to concentrate on when forming uh, this, uh, for fashioning out uh, this uh, foreign policy? What are the critical ingredients of the foreign policy that we need that can reposition Nigeria to become, uh, to continue to be the giant of Africa? Because we've not relinquished that name for anyone, even though countries have overtaken us and all that. Okay, there are two things, if not three, in this um, issue. The very first thing is, giant of Africa is not, well, I'm an architect, I'm not a foreign policy expert. But if I understand certain simple English, giant of Africa cannot be, um, cannot be a foreign policy you know, thrust. It cannot be. It, it, sounds, it sounds off in my ears. Do you understand me? You can say you want to be Afrocentric, okay? In which case, it's going to be Africa first, you're going to like have Africa as the center of your foreign policy thrust. Or you can come like Trump tried to say, look, America, stop being the, you know, the ruler of the world. America first. So you can choose to say, look, the way things are, my own policy is Nigeria first. Okay? And when I have achieved that, you can move that to Africa first. Now, for you to be the giant of Africa is for you to have built yourself to a point where you have a kind of overriding influence on account of how much you are together at home. Your, 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 your uh, democracy is working very well. Your economy is working well. Your economy has been rebased. You have the largest economy. You already have the human, uh, I don't know whether, I don't want to use the word the human capital because I don't know to what extent our own human is capital if we understand what capital is, okay? We have human beings. I don't know if you have human capital. That's a discussion for another day. So, but you have the numbers with respect to persons. 
if you are able to put yourself together, the first thing is that you earn respect. The second thing is that out of the respect, you become the big brother. There is a problem in Ghana, they look for you. There's a problem in Nairobi, Kenya, they look for you. There's a problem in South Africa, the way we were. You know, look at the days of Appetite. It was Nigeria. Look at the days of Ekumok. It was Nigeria. And look at the days everybody looked up to Nigeria because we had the capacity, we had the respect, we had the capability, we had the potentials. That is what makes you a giant and not you giving yourself a name as a giant. No. People will be the ones to call you, wow, this is Africa's big brother. This is Africa's giant. This is Africa's defender. This is Africa's... It's others that will give you that title and not that uh, we want our foreign policy thrust is to be the giant of Africa. That, that doesn't yeah. sound... Um, yeah, but, but that, that is the issue. Um, giant of Africa is the kind of respect that people give you that will make you giant of Africa. And the question was really to get... Uh, to find out why, where do you think that we got it wrong, where the respect that we used to have is no longer there. We don't have that kind of respect anymore. We don't, we, whether in, on the African continent or elsewhere, we don't have that kind of respect anymore. Uh, uh, so where did we get it wrong? What are some of the things that should be put in place for that respect to return? That was the question. The very first thing is how you organize yourself. Look at the very last election. I mean, the whole world literally said this was a sham. It was an opportunity for people to say, wow, did you see the election of Nigeria? It was first class. It was so transparent. It was so well organized. That's where you start, number one. Number two is good governance, where this is a component of, have you gone to do business in Nigeria? Hey, they, are, they, are, they are so organized, their policies are in place, the rule of law, you don't mess in Nigeria. You know, those are the indices that make for, you talk of rule of law. Look at, we are being rated at a stage, we had the third worst terrorist organization in the whole world resident in Nigeria. I mean, how will people respect you for all such indices? So I believe that Mr. Um, the, uh, our, our president, Obong Tinubu, if he means well, like I hope he would, because I always tell people, I'll come to this, who are we having as our president, as of today? Who do we have? Do, are we having this consummate politician who knows how to play the game, who is a master and a don? So we now know what to expect. Because from today or from the day was sworn in, it's about 2027. And it's got to play the politics, not about, or are we having the technocrat leader who was once the governor of Lagos State and people respected Lagos State? He had square pegs in square holes. He was target driven. He got professionals. He was, he was, he was a leader. He made sure things were done right. So who are we having today as the sworn in president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Is it that professional politician or the leader technocrat? Whichever one we have will determine which direction we are going, either to the right or to the left. Or are we having one that is just a hybrid that we really don't, can't even tell, and then we now start to bring in the word clueless? My prayer is that that Tinubu that we had that was once the shining star in Nigeria and brought a lot of innovations and policies into Lagos that are still being used today. That technocrat, that leader, that God will help us and make him for as long as he's on the seat. Whether, you know, the tribunal is still ongoing. It's a long process. Probably in the next um, four months, we may, we may not really know who is going to be our president for the next four years. But while you are there, even if you are there for one day, just hit the ground running and keep going until the final whistle is blown. I always say that of Oshun State, you know that it's only some days back or about two weeks back that Adeleke could now sit well on that seat of power and say, yes, I am the governor for the next four years. You know, there's a tribunal. After the tribunal, there is the appeal. After the appeal, there's a Supreme Court. And it could take us another four months before we can say, this is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for the next four years. But while you are there, even for one day, 
Please be that okay. leader technocrat and help Nigeria. Okay, I wish we had more time, but there, we're out of time. We would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Ezekiel. Yeah, please let me express my condolences to Mr. Doc Percy, you know. The family of Mr. Doc Percy, okay. Yes. Thank you so much. We missed a, um, a media mogul day, so we hope that he rests in peace and the family has the fortitude to bear the loss. Thank you, Mr. Nyok. It, Okay. Thank you. We've been talking with Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok, um, a public affairs analyst. Uh, he usually joins us from Akwai Bomtote, but today he joined us from uh, Abuja. And uh, we're very, uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to be talking with our first guest. <laughs>